Good afternoon and welcome to the first in a series of BBC Scotland webcasts. Every fortnight we'll be putting your questions about Scotland's futures to key figures and decision makers. And I'm joined today by Blair Jenkins, the Chief Executive of the Yes Scotland Independence Campaign. He's no stranger to a TV studio, having previously been Head of News here at BBC Scotland and also at STV. He's also written about the future of newspapers and set out a plan for a Scottish TV channel. So, Blair, thanks very much indeed for Pleasure. coming in. As I say, these are questions submitted by readers of the BBC Scotland News website. Let's start on something close to home for you. It's about broadcasting. It's a question that's come from Paul Lucker, asking what will happen to BBC Scotland after independence? What will happen to the licence fee? And will BBC cease to be the British Broadcasting Corporation? Broadcasting, I think, is one of the most exciting areas when we look ahead to what an independent Scotland will be like. Uh, Scotland, at that point, will continue to receive all the programmes and services that people are used to receiving from the BBC and from other broadcasters. But in addition, I think there'll be far more Scottish content, more Scottish programmes. And we know, I, I know from the research we've done, there's a huge demand in Scotland for a broader range of programmes than we get currently. So just going through the items that Paul uh, mentioned, uh, yes, the BBC services, the services will continue to be available. Um, there will obviously have to be a new arrangement between uh, the BBC and, uh, and, and the EU Scottish Government and any broadcasting authority on the terms and conditions under which the BBC broadcasts in Scotland. Uh, but the one thing you can be absolutely sure of, Douglas, uh, is that right now the BBC will be doing their scenario planning for what happens in the event of Scotland voting yes, as I believe we will. They, uh, they say they're not, but you think they will behind the scenes? Um, yes, they are behind the scenes planning for uh, what would happen when Scotland votes yes. Uh, and uh, there's no doubt that there will be a deal to be struck under which the, all the BBC's programmes and services will continue to be broadcast here. Um, to what extent the licence fee revenue raised in Scotland is allocated to, uh, partly allocated to the BBC, partly allocated to a new Scottish public service broadcaster, those would be the subjects for negotiation. But I but would you imagine, imagine all the channels yep. and radio will be available throughout Scotland as, as well as the rest of, of That's the what the BBC will want. It's what the Scottish Government would want. And also, frankly, it's what the government of the rest of the UK will want when Scotland is independent. They will very much wish to have that uh, connection and to have the BBC still broadcasting here. It's a very important point to remember, of course, that um, we're not just consumers of the BBC here in Scotland. We are part owners of the BBC. So Scotland part funded everything and anything the BBC has done up till now. So all the intellectual property rights and significant developments like the iPlayer, which is how a lot of people watch programmes nowadays. Now, it's sometimes said inaccurately by the No campaign that uh, the iPlayer would not be available in Scotland when we're independent. This is clearly palpable nonsense. Uh, we are part owners of the iPlayer. We funded, in part, the development of the iPlayer. So all those services people are used to will still be available in an independent Scotland. But is, if there's extras for a Scottish broadcasting channel, do you think Scots will have to pay a bit more on the licence fee? There would be no appetite in Scotland for a, a bigger licence fee than presently. So the issue would be how the current licence fee is allocated as between a new Scottish public service broadcaster, which I think would be, would, would be required, and whether there's still a case for part of the licence fee going to the BBC. So those are the areas in which I believe there would be negotiation. But across a whole range of policy areas, when we vote yes, there will be negotiation. Um, frankly, I think broadcasting will, will be one of the easier issues to resolve. I don't think it's going to be one of the tricky ones. Well, let's look at one that uh, could be quite, uh, quite tricky. It's uh, Europe. We started close ah. to home, broader sweep here. Um, we may be heading towards a, a, a referendum on UK membership of the European Union, depending on what happens in politics at Westminster. Yeah. That would be after <coughs> the vote we're facing in Scotland in 2014. Here's a question from James Creerer. What is the point in trying to break free from England to surrender ourselves to the European Union? Well, I think the, the thing about this, uh, the European issue is... When Scotland is independent, if there is a case to be made for withdrawing from the European Union, if there's a political party that wants to put forward that point of view, it's not a point of view I would agree with, but if a, any political party wants to put forward that point of view, then of course they, they, they do so, that's democracy. And if there's a, a feeling, uh, a significant feeling from any political grouping in Scotland when we're independent that we ought not to be in the European Union, then the normal business of democracy is you put that in a manifesto, you try to get yourself elected. If you get elected, then you go ahead and hold a referendum. I, I actually think that's highly unlikely in an independent Scotland. But the interesting thing is, of course, uh, I think any objective uh, commentator now would accept that the greater risk to Scotland right now of not continuing to be in membership of the European Union is if we stay in the UK 
not if we become an independent country. That's becoming clearer by the day. But there's this, this question is put by, by Peter Vincent rather differently. In the event of Scotland becoming independent from the rest of the UK, is the plan to be a standalone country like Norway or Switzerland, or would independence have to mean joining the UK and the single currency? If it's the latter, in the, UK, in the EU with the single currency, it's not really looking much like independence at all. Well, we know as a matter of fact that Scotland cannot be compelled to join the euro uh, once we are an independent country. We will continue in membership of the, the European Union uh, from a position of being within the European Union, terms and conditions of membership will have to be uh, negotiated. But it is very, very You're clear... You're saying we will, Scotland will, or let's say, or Scotland uh, would, with a yes vote, remain a member of the European Union, for well, sure? Uh, yes, because what would happen is, and I think this has been made very clear, very helpfully, just uh, before the end of the year, by David Edward, who's the most distinguished expert on the European uh, rules and regulations, if you like, that we have in Scotland. What has to happen, at the point when we vote yes... Um, legally, in good faith, uh, the European Union at that point has to begin negotiations with Scotland on the terms and conditions of uh, Scotland's continuing membership. There will be uh, an 18-month period between voting yes and uh, the date of independence, during which time it will be easy, or, or rather it will be uh, possible, uh, for all the terms and conditions of continuing membership to be uh, resolved. Well, there's a big claim. It would be easy, and you corrected that, to yeah. possible to resolve all of these. Nobody thinks it's going to be no, easy. Is that's it? which is why I corrected myself. Uh, but it's, it's, it's certainly doable in that time. And uh, I think, again, you know, if you think about the, the fundamental narrative of the No campaign is this assumption that the rest of the world will want, will want to make life difficult for a newly independent Scotland, that we'll, we'll be emerging into a hostile environment where people will behave irrationally towards us. The truth is that the rest of Europe will be very keen to have Scotland as a member of the European Union. And we will be negotiating our new terms and conditions from the position of being inside. And, and that's very clear. It is also very clear that the, there can be no compulsion, because we can look at what's happened with other, uh, other countries. There can be no compulsion about joining the euro. Now, it may be, again, uh, democracy uh, is, is democracy. At some point in the future, it could be that a, a political party in Scotland wishes to suggest membership of the euro currency. And again, at that point, that's something to be put to the people in a referendum. And if Scotland wants to join the euro, it can. At the point at which we, we vote for independence, uh, Scotland will continue in, uh, to use the pound. We will continue to be part of the, the sterling zone, that currency zone. Uh, at a future point, if something else looks more appropriate, then we can make that decision. Well, there's, uh, you, you mentioned one very eminent lawyer. Mm. Uh, anybody else can bring along other lawyers to give different opinions uh, because it's not terribly clear. Here's a question <coughs> from Keith Coates. The Yes campaign claimed that Scotland would gain automatic entry into the European Union. Yet how do we know this is correct? Is there any new solid evidence from the European Commission that says Scotland would gain automatic entry? The, you, you're saying that David Edward offers that? Others are saying otherwise. Well, the, the important point which David Edward makes, and to be honest, which we've been making for some time, is that this is not a legal decision. It will not be a legal decision. It's a political decision. There is, right? nothing, there is nothing in the European treaties which covers the scenario that we're looking at here, where, where Scotland votes to become independent. So the reality is, which is why the, you know, opinions from uh, people in the European Commission or, or elsewhere uh, are not legally founded. This will be a political decision. It will be a political matter. And I think... One of the reasons why I'm glad we have the duration of the referendum campaign that we have and plenty of time to sweep aside some of the, I think, the, 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 the fear tactics, to sweep away some of the roadblocks that people try to put in the, in the way of Scotland voting for, independent, voting for independence is that uh, we can reassure people that uh, the political reality is that there will be a, a great desire to have Scotland in continued membership of the European part, Union. Part of that reassurance is that whenever the question of negotiations comes up, and mm. you, you've raised this already, there's a sort of frankly quite naive assumption that negotiations will go the way Scotland wants them to go and that there wouldn't be any pushback that Whitehall will say, of course Scotland can have whatever it wants. It's not going to work that way, is it? Are you talking about negotiations with the rest of the UK? or the UK, with, yeah. Europe, and future ah. of the BBC we've already raised? Yeah, well, that, that's true. You cannot, um, life uh, is uncertain to that extent. You cannot, uh, you cannot uh, predict exactly how negotiations will go. I think the point I would make is there is every reason to suspect that um, the institutions of the, the European Union uh, and indeed the rest of the UK, once Scotland votes to be independent, will act in enlightened self-interest. In other words, uh, the U European Union will wish to have Scotland in continued membership in part because of uh, the fact that we have 25% of Europe's uh, offshore uh, tidal and wind uh, renewable energy, partly because of the, the oil that we have, um, but for all sorts of other reasons. 
a, a mature uh, democracy like Scotland, which has been in continued membership of the European Union and complying with all the conditions of membership for 40 years, I mean, we, we look like a gold-plated uh, member of the European Union. Why on earth would they not wish us to be members? As far as the negotiations with the rest of the UK go, I believe that, uh, again, at the point at which it becomes clear, and this may be, be before referendum day, at the point at which it becomes clear uh, on or before uh, the referendum that Scotland is heading for independence, the, the interests of the rest of the UK, as, as with Scotland, will be in really very, very good, harmonious and positive relations around these islands, covering everything, covering uh, currency, covering defence, covering the free movement of trade. Well, yes, which would be in having good and harmonious relations right around these islands, as we have with Ireland, for instance. So there, there is no doubt that uh, the scenario which, uh, again, which uh, the No campaign tried to paint of, uh, uh, of, of hostility and, and, and divisiveness, uh, that's not, uh, I think, a likelihood. It's not a scenario that I recognise and it's not how it's going to turn out. Let's move on. We had quite a lot of questions put uh, to you when we said online that you were coming along about people's personal finance, some of them mm. very specific <coughs> questions. You're not qualified as a financial advisor, by the way, are you? Uh, only in an amateur sense. Radio. I think we should re remember <laughs> asset valuations can go down as well as up. Yeah. I'm not qualified either. But let's right. have a, a look at what Billy McCain has been asking about where tax would get paid. He mm. says, my question is fairly straightforward. It's about, it's about pensions. Never trust a man who says that pensions are going to be straightforward. Yep. But his private pension is paid from England. How will you differentiate who pays tax to which government? If there are different rates on either side of the border, would he pay English rates of tax or Scottish rates? Well, I think the key thing about um, a, a private pension is that, uh, and I think this is probably the, the main point people would want to reassure and so on, is that the contract with the pension provider remains the same. So uh, it's not affected by the fact that Scotland is independent. You would continue to get, uh, receive your, your private pension from your pension supplier in exactly the same way. Uh, I imagine the tax regime that would apply would be the one that applies uh, in, in Scotland. That would seem to me to be the logical um, state of affairs. Because that's but, where yeah. Billy lives. But it's a very important point to say this, uh, because... Um, a lot of people would have asked me that question, for instance, about public sector pensions, and I don't know if you're going to move on to public sector pensions, but um, the Scottish Government have guaranteed that, uh, that public sector pensions would continue as currently. Um, but it's, it's a key point to make, is that already a very large percentage of the public centre, sector pensions paid in Scotland are actually run under Scottish schemes, so that the NHS pensions in Scotland, for instance, and uh, the school teacher uh, pension arrangements, those are already run and administered from within Scotland. So in Scotland we already have the situation where hundreds of thousands of public sector pensions are, are funded, are, are administered in Scotland and uh, that system will run very, very smoothly post-independence. Let me tell you about Asif Anwar. He pays UK tax instead of tax in the USA, where he's a citizen. He's actually Scottish born, but he's a citizen of the USA. Uh, now the USA is pointing out it has a tax treaty with uh, the UK, ensuring people don't have to pay tax twice. But of course there's no tax treaty with an independent Scotland and he fears that he may be exposed to double taxation. There's yet more negotiations to take place there and many tax treaties around the world. Well, the, the, you're right, and, and that's the, the detailed work will have to be done on, on this and, and a range of other things. Um, I think my, my general point here would apply, and I, I don't pretend I can give a, a, an absolutely immediate answer to that point because it's quite a specific point, but... Um, there is no reason to believe that, that these matters cannot be resolved for Scotland, as they have been for lots of other independent countries. We are part of an international trend. At, at the end of the Second World War, there were about 50 independent countries in the world. There are now about 200. The long-term trend is towards countries, is towards self-determination of nations. And as part of that process, uh, nations uh, make sure that uh, the, the arrangements they have inherited and the arrangements they take forward work very well for everybody. There's no reason to think it would be otherwise. OK, R.P. James says, like many Scots, I have bonds with national savings and investments, uh, which is underwritten by the UK government. Since you have to have a UK address to hold these national savings bonds, will this R.P. James be compelled to relinquish them under the plans for independence? I think that would be part of the... I'm sure those ongoing arrangements would be resolved between the Scottish Government and the UK Government. I don't, I don't see any reason why, uh, why they would be disadvantaged when Scotland votes, uh, votes for independence. OK, on benefits, staying with, with personal finance issues, Aid Hunter says uh, he's a pensioner living in Scotland. What does the Yes Scotland campaign have to say uh, about the direct benefits that uh, his, his wife and, uh, and Aid enjoy, such as free bus travel in Scotland, free medicine uh, prescriptions, winter fuel heating allowance? Can all of these things be afforded? 
Yes, absolutely. And I, I mean, it's a very key distinction. I think it's one of the, the strongest arguments for, for our independence. Is I, th I do think we take a different view in Scotland about uh, having decent levels of public provision and, and, and provision of public services. So those things would continue. It's, uh, again, it's a statistical fact that um, all of the pension and welfare benefits that we have in Scotland are currently constitute a smaller percentage of our economy than, uh, than they do in the UK economy. So, for instance, um, the total cost of pension and welfare benefits in uh, Scotland relative to the total tax revenues raised in Scotland is about 40% of the tax revenues uh, raised within Scotland. At a UK level, it's 42%. So we actually, we actually currently spend a smaller percentage of our uh, national wealth, if you like, in terms of government revenues than the whole of the UK. So uh, pensions and welfare benefits in an independent Scotland would be more affordable than they are currently with the UK regime. That may be part of the answer to a question that's come from <coughs> Ginny Allen. We're broadening this out to the economy more widely. Will the grant for the elderly for winter fuel bills still be paid? Answered that, I think. I'm very sceptical, says Ginny Allen, that Scotland is going to be financially viable in being able to provide health, NHS, military, etc. Where is the money going to come from? This is a question you must get quite often. Uh, I think only because it, it comes up a lot, and I mean, and I understand why it's asked, because there has been a, an attempt for many years to present a false picture of the Scottish economy and that and the Scottish economy somehow underperforms the rest of the UK. The, the good thing is that we now have the, uh, the official figures, we now have uh, detailed accounts on this, so spanning a period now of many years, to demonstrate, particularly in recent years, that the Scottish economy outperforms the UK economy. And that's true of the, of the last five years for which we have official figures, that the Scottish economy outperforms the UK economy. Less true if you take a longer period. So um, well, un unclear if you take the next five to Well, we had, the, we had the, the startling uh, uh, news from the UK Treasury just at the beginning of the year. They, they looked over a 12-year period and, and, and said that uh, over a 12-year horizon, uh, a, an independent Scotland, an independent Scotland uh, relative to the UK economy, everyone in Scotland would have been a pound a year worse off. Uh, now, we had an overwhelming response when this revelation emerged from the Treasury, which was to say, well, if independence uh, would only cost us a pound a year, we, we don't accept the analysis, by the way, but even the UK Treasury analysis is uh, that uh, independence would only cost each Scot an average of one pound a year. On that basis, people said, we, we, we want to take it. The key thing about that finding, that, uh, that, that report from the UK Treasury, is that there is strong polling evidence that if people in Scotland believe they will be no worse off under independence, then, majority, then opinion shifts very heavily in favour of independence, which is why that was such an important concession from the Treasury. Now, of course, all of this arithmetic around the public finances depends on uh, a share, a, a big mm -hmm. share of the oil revenue that's currently going into the, the, the Treasury. So here's a question <coughs> from David Doherty. Mm -hmm. Given that a large number of oil fields in Scottish waters will be coming to the end of their lives within the next few years, how realistic is it for an independent Scotland to expect a constant stream of revenue from the oil sector? Well, the, um, the expert analysis or the expert prediction is that there are at least 40 years of, of very healthy uh, revenues from uh, the, the, the oil fields which uh, would fall to Scotland uh, when, when we're independent. So oil is not the be-all and end-all of the Scottish economy and we can talk about, and I know you, this, is, this is your area of expertise, we can't talk about other sectors which are very, very strong and which will develop in the future. But the great thing about oil, um, you know, again, which is sometimes presented by the other side as almost a problem for Scotland, the oil revenues, it gives us a fantastic underpinning. It gives us a fantastic basis on which to build a strong, modern, successful economy. So we know that there are, uh, you know, a trillion pounds worth of, uh, of oil reserves uh, still to be exploited. We know that new technology is meaning that more and more oil is recoverable. Uh, now, but with higher tax breaks. Well, yeah, but you, if you watch what the Treasury is doing at the moment, yeah. they're managing to get mm. more exploration and production so long as they give higher tax breaks. That's well, not good news in the arithmetic. Well, of the that's right. Finances. And the other, the other key factor in this, of course, is, is of course the price of oil. And, and there is volatility in the price of oil. But oh, that is true over, uh, over a period of time. These things will even out. Some years oil will be more, some years it will be less. But oil is a fantastic resource for Scotland. I think we can be very, very uh, confident about the future health of the Scottish economy. I just make, can I just go back just ever so slightly, Douglas, on, on the, the, the series of detailed questions you had on personal finance? Because I, I would accept that you know, I, I perhaps wasn't given the detail in some of these questions. I wasn't giving you the time. But well, uh, do, well, no, well, no, and to be, be honest, I mean, um, I, I, don't, I don't have the detail on some of those points. Some of those are quite precise points on, on, on bonds and things. Um, I'm in the fortunate position, since I'm not a politician, I don't have to pretend to have an answer to every question. Um, but what I can certainly do for the people who've written in with those questions is I will go away and, uh, and get the answers to those questions and, and hopefully provide the kind of detail that people were looking for on those precise points. 
but I hope I can be very reassuring and have been very reassuring on, on pension provision, what happens with uh, pensions, whether you're in a private pension scheme or a public uh, sector pension scheme, and on the broader economy and, and the, the, um, the health of oil revenues going forward. I think there's a very, very strong story to tell, which should give people in Scotland real confidence. Let's look at the other side of this economic or public finance uh, coin. The cost of what's being proposed mm. here. Alistair Simpson asks, how much will it cost to set up government departments such <coughs> as, I'm going to take a deep breath here, defence, foreign affairs, home affairs, trade and industry, energy, transport, social security, employment, professional regulations, health and medicine, media and culture, and other bodies such as Ordnance Survey, asks Alistair. Where is the money going to come from for all of that? Now, the point he's making here is, I think that, that smaller countries, the, the sort of unit cost, so they can't spread cost across a big population the way that you can with mm. the UK. The other point behind this, he's not spelling it out, but I will for you, the transition cost, the cost of mm -hmm. setting up all of these different bodies could be very significant. Yes, but again, I think you have to look at what we pay currently. Scotland currently pays, roughly speaking, £50 million a year towards the cost of all the various government departments which are, which are based in London. Um, if you think about the fact that what we'll be doing in setting up the infrastructure of an independent country is bringing an enormous number of high-value jobs into Scotland, high-value jobs which are currently located in London. So there'll be a, an immediate employment boost in Scotland from the fact that we will be creating the institutions of an independent state. We will stop paying £50 million, uh, which, which is going elsewhere, and we'll spend money on, uh, on, on the infrastructure of government here. The other but less major, efficiently. Yeah, I mean, well, the, other, the other major saving which will kick in right away, of course, is the £250 million a year we'll save from not having to pay towards Trident. So uh, the institutions of government are eminently affordable in an independent Scotland, uh, and the money and the jobs that go along with uh, government departments, civil servants and, and all those departments uh, that were mentioned, those jobs and that money will be in the Scottish economy. It's, it's an important point and I think one that we'll be making more and more this year. When you look around the world, it is very clear that the most successful economies in the world are small economies and that's becoming more and more true with the passing of time. Smaller countries, smaller economies are more nimble, they're able to adapt much more quickly uh, there's a greater uh, coherence and, and, and unity of purpose. Uh, and the, all the evidence is, if you look at the top 10 countries in the world and the top 10 economies in terms of uh, uh, GDP per head, uh, they are small countries, many of them smaller countries in Scotland. But are you saying that the government is may be more nimble and effective and yeah. faster growing? You're making that point. Is, can government be as efficient? Because what you're describing sounds a bit like a big bureaucracy <coughs> moving north of the border and we're going to have our own bureaucracy. It doesn't necessarily sound very attractive to everybody. Well, I think it's a smaller bureaucracy. Clearly, you would not replicate the, the size of uh, our governmental infrastructure that, 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 that the UK has. And uh, everything that we do would be subject to you know, cost-benefit analysis and, and, and those things. Um, I'm, not, I'm not advocating big government. That would never be something I, I would necessarily advocate. I think what I'm saying is that there, is a, there, is a, there, is a number, there are a number of jobs, many of them high-value jobs, associated with governmental departments. Uh, those jobs would be in Scotland. They would not be in London. Let's stick uh, with the uh, economy on this question of how would Scotland have dealt, this is from uh, Jeremy Mundy, I should say. Uh, I don't know whether he's uh, starting south or north of the border. You can make your own mind up. How would Scotland have dealt with the financial crisis <coughs> if it had been independent? Will the Scottish state uh, assume the debt taken on to rescue Royal Bank of Scotland and Halifax Bank of Scotland? That's just over four years ago. How would the fate of the country have been any different to Ireland's? Well, I think a key point is um, we, we might very well not have had the, the financial crisis had Scotland been independent. I think it's a key point that's not made often enough that all of us in Scotland were depending upon the UK government and the UK financial regulator to be doing their jobs and not to have allowed what did happen to happen. Now, are you, so, are you so saying the Scottish politicians were saying you're, you're no. being far too... Tough on these uh, banks, or were they, were they actually saying that well, they, there was gold-plated regulation no, going no, on? What I'm, what I'm saying is a lighter touch regulation. Uh, what I'm saying is, um, I think everyone in Scotland, whatever their view was, I mean, and, and they might not have known the detail of what the banks were up to, the casino banking that we that we now know about. But I think what all of us in Scotland were entitled to assume was that the UK government and the UK financial regulator were looking after our interests. Now it turns out they were actually asleep at the wheel, uh, and we did have the financial crisis of several years ago. Where, and Scotland is still paying the price for negligence at UK level. We are still paying the price in Scotland in terms of jobs being lost, services being cut, many of the hardship measures that are being forced through now, uh, which are proving so difficult and so hugely unpopular in Scotland, are as a result of the fact that our interests were not being looked after 
by the UK government and the UK financial regulator. Now, well, moving my on, memory is of Alex Salmond saying that there, mm. that there should be lighter touch uh, regulation, or at least mm. as light touch regulation as Westminster was. And, the, I'm, and I'm sure lots of other politicians are saying the same thing. My point remains, Douglas, that we were placing our trust in the UK government and the UK financial regulator who did not look after our interests. Uh, and I believe that had Scotland been independent as a smaller country, we would have been paying closer attention. It's not to say it necessarily wouldn't have happened, but at least uh, in a sense you, you, you make your own mistakes. You, d you don't pay the huge price of the mistakes other people made on your behalf. Well, let's now, go, the, go back banking, to Jeremy's question. On the uh, banking question, yeah. Would the Scottish state <coughs> assume the debt taken on to rescue RBS and The international course? precedent for uh, banking debts when, back, when things like this happen is that the proportion of the debt uh, which is attributed to any one country depends on where the area of operation of the bank was. Now, 90% of the activities of RBS uh, was in London. Uh, I think RBS, uh, you know, and people know the, the broad history of what happened. Uh, RBS in, it, in, its, uh, uh, in its corporate banking bought into the city of London culture, the anything goes casino culture, uh, with the results that we now all know about. But in terms of where the burden uh, lies, then uh, the, the division of burden, and this has happened with the banks because the United States picked up some of the, the, the debt burden of RBS because of RBS activities in that country. So 90% of the activities, activities were in the UK. But the total net, um, and you'll know these figures even, even better than I do, Douglas, because it's your area of expertise. I think the, the net uh, cost of the, the bank bailout in the UK was ended up being uh, £66 billion. Pounds. Uh, Scotland would have to pay a, a per capita share so of the, that the, the total debt. So the answer to Jeremy Monday is no. Scotland would not, uh, would not assume all of those debts. They'd be shared around. Uh, of RBS. We yeah. would pay, we'd pay, we'd have to, my view, and I think this is the right view, is we would pay our uh, yeah. population share of, the, of the, uh, the inherited liability, the inherited deficit bailout. OK, rattling through a few questions. We don't have long left. Here's a question from Dave Stephen. If Scotland gains independence, are all Scots then obliged to take a Scottish passport? Or is the option open to retain a UK passport? I'll add to that one from Scott Watson. Would Scottish-born people who live in England be able to apply for a Scottish passport? Yes and yes is, is my, my view, and I'm sure that's what's you been said. You could hold a Scottish and a rest of UK passport, and you can live in England and have a Scottish passport if you're, if you're born here. That's my understanding, Douglas. Yeah, I think, I think that's absolutely right. Okay, and as I'm, I sure, say, I'm sure some people would want to have right both. On. Some people would want one and not the other. To try to cram in as many questions as we can, here's a question about who can vote. It comes from Charlie uh, Carlo. Uh, why are over 400,000 English, Welsh, Irish, Polish, Australian, Dutch and any other nationality allowed to vote while over 800,000 Scots living outside Scotland are not? That's Charlie's number, not mine, but you get the point. Yeah, um, and this is again, this is in line with international precedent. It is always the case that a vote on independence held in, in any country is a vote for those who are resident and on the electoral register in that country. Um, and there is no political party suggesting that the franchise for this uh, independence referendum should be anything other than those who are resident in Scotland and entitled to vote in Scotland. But this question keeps coming up. I mean, yeah. you, you must recognise there's a lot of exiled Scots pretty disappointed that they, they don't have a say in their future. Uh, I, yeah, I understand that. But um, I, I think the, this is not about... Um, I, I think uh, to be eligible to vote in a, in a Scottish referendum ought not to be a test of ethnicity. It's about residency. Uh, and I think, uh, while I know, I'm sure, I mean, I, you know, I have family and friends uh, who, who live overseas and who would like to be here to vote yes uh, in October, November 2014, and who won't be. Uh, and I'm sure that's true of people who are on the other side of the argument. But I think we, the, the, the basis of the franchise for the referendum is, uh, is agreed between the parties. OK, let's ask uh, one question, final question. It's about the question that goes in the paper. Mm. The proposal from the Scottish Government at the moment, do you agree that Scotland should be an independent country? It's faced some criticism uh, that it may skew the way people answer if it starts with the words, do you agree, for instance. Now, here's a question from Keith from Edinburgh. Uh, if the Electoral Commission, which is looking at this question at the moment to see if it's fair, if it says that the question is biased and they support a change, will the Yes campaign, of which you're Chief Executive, agree with that change or does the campaign follow what the SNP says only and support whatever the SNP wants? Well... The answer to the question is it will be a decision made in the Scottish Parliament. It will be for the Scottish Parliament to respond to the advice provided by the uh, Electoral Commission and that's where it will properly uh, be determined. I would very much expect the Electoral Commission with its experience and, and its record and its uh, expertise to come back with a, a very sensible uh, response to its consultation and, and I doubt in the end that this will actually prove something that's, that's very difficult to resolve. 
I think the question is a fair question. Uh, if the Electoral Commission suggests any amendments to the question, I'm sure they'll produce very good evidence as to why they think You'd go with the required. Electoral Commission, no, even if there's a majority to push well, it through at Hollywood? What I've said about it, and it's, it's, a, it's an important point, because it's a point that's frequently made by, by Westminster governments, the Electoral Commission is advisory. Its advice is not mandatory. So uh, I think it's a very important distinction. But at the end of the day, I think once the question is determined, and it will be, we begin a really interesting debate, which is what kind of country do you want Scotland to be? What kind of society do you want Scotland to be? I think that's where people will increasingly focus their attention. Well, we've got uh, quite a bit more of this to come. We could go on, but we're keeping this uh, digestible online half hour. As I say, the debate will go on elsewhere. My, my thanks to Blair Jenkins for coming in and to you, our viewers and online readers, for supplying these questions. You'll be able to put your questions to our future guests on this regular webcast. Join us for the next one on Friday the 1st of February. In the meantime, if you want to find out more about the independence debate, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash Scotland's future. Till next time then, farewell.